I'm so happy to meet Nancy in the Hastings Center. Why we haven't met and fallen in love sooner than today, I have no reason, uh, don't know, but um, uh, consider us making a second date. I'm, I'm looking forward to collaborating with you. There are two thingies here. Does it matter which one I use? Okay, great. And I'm gonna keep a timer too, uh, one, so that you can get to the uh, work at hand and also because sadly I have to go catch a flight. So if a little beeper goes off, um, that's just me. Um, so thank you, um, Chris and Jen and David for having me uh, here. Um, spoiler alert, I do not have an answer that I'm gonna share with you today about the Just City, um, but rather sort of set up a, a series of prompts for you all to think about over the course of the afternoon and just give you a little bit of overview of how I came to form uh, the Just City Lab and this question. Um, of embedding these notions of justice or just city uh, in design work as an architect, urban designer, and planner. Um, ten years ago, actually this month, I started my own practice called Urban Planning for the American City. Um, you're previewing one of my um, experiments with a new logo, um, Urban AC. Um, and I, I came to that work quite by coincidence. I, I just finished uh, or resigned from being Cory Booker's first planning director in his first term in Newark, New Jersey. Um, and I quit a job without a job. And then a month later, the Kresge Foundation phoned me along with Mayor Dave Bing and asked if I'd get involved in the work um, in Detroit. And that launched a, a really specific kind of practice for me, um, which is one where I um, partnered myself with cities, civic leaders, and organizations who were really putting on the table in the context of what seemed like fairly mundane planning work, these issues of tackling racial segregation inequality and disparity and they were wanting to tackle those in really meaningful ways which meant it was going to take a lot of hard work a lot of introspection and actually a lot of time and resources and I've come to um, do that work in several cities across the US now each with these um, histories of contested spaces like a Memphis like a Pittsburgh like a Philadelphia like a Milwaukee I'm currently working in uh, st. Louis and the principles of my practice are really embedded in a handful of values, which is about inclusion. Um, I rarely take on work where there's a single client. I think the work of dis dismantling these systems and seeking uh, greater justice implicates a number of different sectors. It's not just the community and government. It's not just business and institutions. All of those sectors have to come together and form a client group. This notion of ownership, um, those sectors, all of them have to feel a sense of ownership of the process and the outcome. Um, outcomes being who owns land, but um, ownership and who owns the process, who sets the problem, who gets to decide. Um, we have to come to this problem with innovation, innovative solutions. We've got to be willing to try and experiment with tactics that haven't been done before and perhaps fail at them the first time in order to really dismantle and disrupt. Um, I like to think I approach my work uh, with integrity. Um, I spend a lot of time with potential clients trying to understand if I'm the right person for them. Uh, at this stage in my career, I'm pretty deeply committed to addressing this issue um, of systemic change. And so if that's not where we align, that's not a project that I tend to work on. And I'm deeply invested in doing this co collaboratively. Um, so I started my firm with the project Detroit Future City um, back in 2009 um, and we published a, a fairly comprehensive uh, piece of work called Detroit Future City which had the elements of looking at economic growth, neighborhoods, land use, city infrastructures, public land and civic engagement. Neighborhoods was obviously one of them. If you know the story of Detroit from the last five years or so, it was a city that had over 100,000 vacant and abandoned parcels. And so the first instance was to think about this as a land use proposition. Where should we um, deploy resources to address vacant and abandoned land? How do we stop the hemorrhage of population? So there is a part of this that addresses the repositioning of land and how to turn vacant land from a liability to an asset and how to make sure we were deploying resources in every neighborhood that makes sense because we did still believe that every neighborhood had a future. 
On top of that, though, this plan was very much about people and places together. So we spent a lot of time in two years of very deep and robust engagement talking about this notion of quality of life and what were the quality of life factors that neighborhoods needed to think about. And there were different neighborhoods. If you were a neighborhood that was most vulnerable to vacant land, you had another one set of quality of life issues. And if you were a neighborhood that was fairly wealthy and not experiencing that kind of hemorrhaging of people or, or properties, you had another set of quality of life. So some of this was about nuancing the way we thought about quality of life and for who. Um, I'm sorry this slide is so dark, but we looked at the demographics of the city as any uh, responsible plan would do, but we also looked at it relative to who was staying, who was leaving, and who was arriving. 31% of the population was staying, and um, senior population was expected to grow by 17% um, on an annual basis. And so the fact that this was a fairly large population that was actually staying in place meant that the, the issues that we needed to think about for that population in specific geographies of the city became even more important. So just as one example, we looked at multifunctional streets, right? So a street is not just how you move cars back and forth. A street is not just transportation. It holds a series of goods and services that are important to populations in proximity to those streets. So the way in which we thought about those populations staying, leaving, or arriving, and the way in which a multifunctional street needed to be designed not only for mobility, but in terms of services became a very important aspect of the plan. I'm currently finishing work in St. Louis, another contested city, uh, looking at a five-mile urban greenway project. And central to the work they wanted us to do um, in this plan as an infrastructure project was to look at issues of equity. I often find when I'm going in the cities that equity is framed in a couple of very narrow ways. Uh, it's either framed as a WMBE compliance or contracting measure, how can I get more women and minority businesses contracts within this construction or development project, or it's very narrowly framed as community outreach. How can we design a process that gets people to a table, sitting in a room not unlike this, and asking their opinion? That's usually a very one-way exchange of relationships. And that tends to be the way in which people check a box on uh, equity and inclusion. Um, these traditional measures of equity are completely unacceptable to me. Um, and so this was a project by which we were able to fill in the gap between compliance and community engagement by introducing four new frames to think about it. Um, we've introduced the notion of not only compliance, but businesses, jobs, and wealth creation. So these issues, again, of ownership kind of come back in the play. And that's everything from how are we growing small businesses, how are we keeping small businesses in place, everything to financial empowerment in the household. And I'm sure you can imagine aging populations whose income are, is slowing down. Financial empowerment is a very important aspect. Um, quality of life and neighborhoods. There should be a way in which we talk about equitable development when we think about neighborhood development and community development and household um, quality of life. We should be able to think about that in terms of the identity and culture of a place, and we should be able to think about that not in, just in terms of civic engagement and participation, but also civic capacity, a community's capacity to engage and empower themselves towards action. So we've developed this very elaborate way of defining what these potential fillers in the gap of equitable practice are, and we also associate metrics with those. Um, part of the work we do in the Just City Lab is is how can we provide evidence that we're actually producing more just outcomes? And so part of the work that we're doing is in St. Louis is um, producing this, and it'll probably be public in a month or so, so you'll all get to see it more robustly. Um, so in practice, these are the kinds of issues that come up for me, and so I had this amazing opportunity first at the City College of New York to create a design center named after a fairly well-known African-American architect, J. Max Bond, whose work was very much vested in seeing architecture as a social art and addressing these issues. And so I named a center in a pursuit of trying to understand the ways with which design and planning could have a meaningful impact on the issues of social and spatial justice. I was able to bring that work here three years ago and started um, the Just City Lab. And it poses this sort of proposition after about four years into it, which is, is a just city where people 
uh, all people and communities, but especially the least not included, um, have access to networks and environments that offer the opportunities and resources to be productive and prosperous, advancing their social and economic mobility and agency. This is our working definition for now. It may change. Um, we ask a very simple question. How can design and planning dismantle uh, the conditions of injustice in cities and neighborhoods in the public realm? And it's really asking, can it? Um, I started this work not with a definitive answer for that. I wanted to be proven uh, if this was so and how effective were we or were we not in this pursuit. Um, I have the great privilege of working with the extraordinary students here within the GSD. Um, I actually have had some students from the Chan School. I've had students from MIT. Um, and I've uh, had 15 amazing uh, students work with us over the last three years. A couple are in this room and are going to be engaging with you uh, later. The lab uh, operates in four different ways. Um, as Nancy introduced, we have published uh, two books. One is the Just City Essays. These are all free, and you can download them at our website, designforthejustcity.org. Um, and we've also built a, 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 an evaluation tool for evaluating the presence of urban justice and public life and public space, looking at New York City's public plaza programs. Uh, this is a framework that uses 74 different metrics to measure the way in which justice shows up in the public realm. This is also free and available for you to download at designforthejustcity.org. Um, we also investigate the ways in which uh, designers combat social and spatial justice through their work, and we showcase those solutions through both um, case studies and exhibitions. Um, we have about 10 or 12 case studies on our website that you can look at, and we spend time with the designers and we do our own independent research to evaluate the ways in which the designer set forward a set of values that they were trying to accomplish through their practice and interrogate the ways in which they were effective or ineffective at doing that. And it's been a great way for designers to reflect upon their work and to assess whether or not uh, what they intended to um, be put forward was realized or whether other outcomes surfaced uh, that they didn't expect. And so I encourage you to go um, and look at some of those sites. Um, we've had the opportunity to create uh, two um, significant exhibitions, one here at the Loeb Library at the GSD, the second one at the Center for Architecture in New York, which allowed us to showcase both projects and voices and the content of the work that we're doing to larger audiences. And I should say that the, the intent of the work that we put forward on the website is really open source. We very much are encouraging people to act access the work and integrate it and experiment with it in the spaces uh, where they work. Um, as a part of the first exhibition we did, we created a oral history narrative catalog and you'll there are four or five different um, voices on there asking different people from different populations from different uh, disciplines and sectors of practice to talk to us about their notion of justice or just city their experiences with injustice and their um, visions for a future. Um, I'm going to show you like just one second of, <laughs> not one second, one minute of uh, Susan Feinstein, who's the author of uh, The Just City, which was one of the inspirations for my work, um, and let you hear a little bit about her thoughts on The Just City. Hi, I'm Susan Feinstein. I'm a senior research fellow at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. I wrote the book, The Just City, because I was really concerned that neoliberalism was taking over city planning. I have taught planning for decades. Uh, my students originally were very concerned with issues of justice and inequality, uh, but then increasingly their main concern became economic development. And this was uh, driving what they were doing rather than being really oriented towards the needs of those people who were disadvantaged in cities. I tried to figure out how one could take a concept of justice and make it practical. The uh, philosophers who talk about justice tend to talk about it very abstractly. So I read a lot of philosophers. I came up with three ideas, three principles, three criteria that you would say uh, were hallmarks of justice, uh, which I called democracy, diversity, and equity. But then what did this mean if you were actually a city planner 
or an architect or a urban designer or a politician? Uh, what did it mean when you were at the level of the municipality rather than at the national government? So I concerned myself with what were the kinds of policies uh, that worked uh, their way down to people who uh, were in need, who were disadvantaged by race or by gender or by economic situation. So my concern with the Just City arose from seeing certain groups within the city uh, who were discriminated against because of their racial or ethnic characteristics, because they were immigrants or because they were Muslims uh, or uh, simply because they were poor. Uh, but uh, simply a matter of not having enough income uh, doesn't explain everything that uh, disadvantages people. Uh, so I was concerned with the people who were disadvantaged. But I also want to say that it isn't just a matter of wanting to do something for the people who are disadvantaged. It's seeing them in relationship to the people who are advantaged. Uh, so that uh, this is a structural issue having to do generally with the fact that we have seen increasing inequality uh, in the United States, in Europe, uh, in the world generally. Uh, in the last uh, 30 or so years. I don't think that we any can, um, single... Take it down, thank you. Um, I hope I've piqued your interest and you'll go to designforthejustcity.org to finish Susan and the other um, uh, voices here. Um, and this was a way for us to, um, through different people's stories and interests to begin to talk about and personalize this notion of justice and that it shows up in many different ways for many different people and for people to really think about whether or not um, uh, all of us perhaps have experienced some kind of injustice in our personal space uh, as a way of building empathy for thinking about how to integrate this work into our practices going uh, forward. Um, the other thing we do is engage, and so um, this is one of the great reasons why I look forward to collaborating with um, Nancy and her colleagues at Hastings, um, because the thing that I was really curious about in interrogating the role of planning and design and its impact on social and spatial justice was in part brought through a frustration I was experiencing as a practitioner um, in my clients or my um, elected officials asking me for equity, sustainability, uh, and resiliency, uh, and being unable to tell me what they thought that meant. Um, and in many times being in a room with people sitting around tables like this where everyone says, yes, equity is what we want, but no one ever unpacks what that means. And so when you get around to trying to design a, an outcome, uh, there's great frustration because people say, well, that's not equity to me. Well, maybe if you had spent some time talking about and unpacking what that means, um, we might get to solutions that are more meaningful for more people. And so I realized that the language we were using was too um, restrictive uh, and too narrow. And depending on who I was talking to, people used a much richer vocabulary and or needed a much richer vocabulary to get to the nuance of what was important for them in their communities and in their spaces. So we've created what's called the Just City Index. It's actually an index of 50 values um, that we encourage communities, practitioners, public officials to use as a way of building a kind of common ground, a common narrative of aspirations that help to guide the planning and strategy work that they're doing in their spaces. Um, we have um, used this in a number of different ways. It too is available for you to download free on our website. Um, we've created a master class with um, the Veld Academy in Rotterdam. We were invited to work with them and universities across Rotterdam to co-create a, a class that will allow students from a number of different disciplines to experiment with a values-based approach to planning in different neighborhoods throughout Rotterdam. We have created workshops both here through our Black and Design Conference. We've done workshops in South Africa. You are going to be a part of a workshop today, whether you realize it or not, uh, that helps us interrogate the role that values can play in helping to 
get towards more meaningful outcomes. Sorry about that. Um, we use really simple devices like uh, these postcards that we sometimes give when we're out speaking at conferences like this that allow us to get a sense of how people think about the values that are either missing or are needed in their communities. And you are going to be doing an exercise very similar to this. Um, we're at a point where we've collected and, and developed a body of work where I really wanted um, colleagues, uh, both in the field and without the field, um, from outside of the field, I should say, to come and give us some critical feedback and a peer review on the work we've done to date. So just this past spring, we invited 40 such practitioners uh, here to the GSD to dialogue in a closed door session uh, about our work that can uh, and provide us input on ways to help advance it more critically. Um, important, as I mentioned before, is building an evidence of what a just city is. Um, in the design space, we do little research that interrogates the impact of our work, but I think um, this can allow us a platform to do so. So we have begun to collect data um, through these different workshops and convenings that we do because we believe it's essential to helping us confirm the effects of what it is that we do. So for example, in one workshop we did here um, where we were asking people about uh, their practice and notions of any of the values, we saw that 43% of the cases that addressed equity based on their feedback did so through projects on housing. Um, in this particular um, convening, this was the distribution of the workshop participants by region. And when we asked them to prioritize and select the values that they thought were most important by their city, we aggregated the cities and saw that this is how values were being distributed. This is in 2017. Um, what's interesting is in the South, you'll see equity and this notion of identity was really prominent. This is also around the Charlottesville uh, incident. Um, issues of trust in, in the Midwest is also around some pretty interesting things going on in Chicago politics and some other things happening in Detroit. And so you can see how these values might ebb and flow. And so part of our proposition is we should never have a fixed or narrow framework by which to evaluate how we get to justice. These things change over time and should be drafted very specifically by context. Right, So we don't give you 12 values and say you're just. We want you to select the values that are important to the context that you're in and be willing to use them as a living framework. Um, when we ask people uh, to pick uh, the values that were most addressed through their project, this is another way we shot it. Um, so you have were given today, and um, my new friend Kyle was <laughs> nice enough to let me borrow his. So in your program, you were given this worksheet. And so since we have um, a focus group uh, here with you today, we really encourage you throughout the day, the afternoon, as you're listening to presentations, to begin to fill this out. Um, reflect on the space that you're working in, the city you're working in, the sector you're working in. What are the conditions of injustice that you are working on or experiencing as it relates to this notion of aging? Um, you have a handful of these lovely um, stickers. These are the 12 to the core values of our Just City Index. And the artwork was actually done uh, by our uh, research assistants. We encourage you to populate your values with one of the stickers. We have extras if you want them. You're also willing to take one with you if you like. Um, and then um, our partners at the Joint Center in Hastings also would like you to consider what strategies might you think of? And this may be prompted by something you hear from the panels today. And if you know of a good example of a practice that's, that's operating in the space you're in or a city or another city, we'd love to collect that too. At the break around 3.15 to 3.45, various volunteers are gonna come around and collect your worksheets. So you can either leave them completed on your table when you go take a break or there'll be people stationed by the door to collect them. We're gonna collect them because 
Journalist Chris is going to report on the findings of what this cohort of people this afternoon thinks are some of the more critical issues of injustice as it relates to aging and what some of the critical values are as it relates to aging. So we really do encourage you to be good sports. And, and fill this out. And then we will collectively collect this information and figure out how we can both push it back to you and use it to help us all further our work. So thank you and have a wonderful afternoon.